quick introduction to those of you that weren't here last week for the first design workshop. This is the second uh, week for the design workshop. Uh, last week, Arno ran everyone through how to find your unique impact potential in your game, trying to get your players active on an environmental theme that works best for your game and, and your players. And today, we are here with Clayton, who is going to share a little bit more detail about how to best approach that. And I think he'll do a, uh, an introduction of himself as well. So I'll hand the mic to you, Clayton, and have fun, everyone. Hi. Thank you, everyone. Um, I'm Clayton Woodall. This year, we are working to guide you all through, um, as designers, through your Green Game Jam's mission of inspiring actions that lead to a big impact. Uh, as Arno outlined in the first workshop series, uh, we, we um, are here to explore exactly how well-designed games can transform their audiences to inspire real-world action. Now, Arno began by outlining how to identify your game's unique impact potential. And in the next workshop, Trevin uh, will show you how to design specifically for intended impact with large and small examples. Today, I will explore the great in between, the science and psychology of what people actually need in order to take climate action and how games are able to achieve that. Now, one thing I want to call out early in this is something that if you ignore everything else for the next hour, I hope you remember is that it isn't as simple as the image on the screen uh, suggests, right? It's not games in, actions out. People are complex and unique and we must move beyond thinking about them as being acted on if we want to empower them to take their own actions. They aren't NPCs, right? They're the main characters. All we can do them is give them the right skills to win. So why would you take my word for this? Uh, I'll provide an example of my work and how effective the model we've been working on is for the last six years by uh, citing my own life. Six years ago, I was following a career in education. I was working as a corporate management consultant and a leadership coach. And I suddenly decided I wanted to do something more personally meaningful with my life. I began a PhD focusing on climate psychology and learning game design. And I've since published numerous research articles, developed a model for designing climate games. And armed with that knowledge and the education, uh, I joined the IGD Climate SIG and have led the authoring of the Environmental Game Design Playbook. And since that time, I've taken over as a co-chair of the IGD Climate SIG and advised numerous green games initiatives, including the University of Delaware and this Playing for the Planet Green Game Workshop. Uh, I have also uh, had the honor of serving as the Sustainable Forestry Initiatives uh, Manager of Learning and Education Initiatives, uh, which gives me the over gives me the privilege of overseeing the development of climate resources that are uh, deployed all across North America. Now, in our last workshop, my friend Arno gave you the tools to unlock your game's unique impact potential. His guiding principle here is that by understanding your audience and your game, you can find the effective environmental message that spans the convergence of the two. That is, for every game, there is a way to include environmental messaging that is both organically integrated into the gameplay and appropriate for the player base. But the impact potential is exactly that, potential. We need a way to effectively harness all of this potential into something, and that something is action. How do we do this? How do we convert raw potential known only to the design team into climate action? on the part of the player base. We can answer that by narrowing our focus of design. Our goal here is to achieve action, but action is this broad term, even when contextualized within the unique impact potential. There is this risk of not achieving the goal because it is so vague, in the same way that a business wouldn't set out to like make money or make a game. It wouldn't be a very good strategic goal just in the same way that a social goal of inspiring action is not specific enough to be strategically effective. More to the point, action isn't something that we can just teach directly. We 
No, as climate scientists, that climate action is the result of a decision made by an individual. And it's not something that's a response to five minutes of playing a game. Truly impactful action requires three things. Actionable knowledge, which is knowledge that can be acted on by the individual in their context and situation. Knowledge that is relevant to achieving their personal mission. Intent. They have to have a self-driven and socially supported desire to enact change. And felt impact. They have to feel, or at least expect to feel, a personal impact from taking action. They have to feel a result that is close to home and solves not only a global issue, but one that is local as well. Luckily, there is for us something of a cheat code for this, because while we can't just magic up action, we can, with strong confidence, inspire behavior. Behavior, unlike action, which is this self-determined course of action, behavior is more like a short-term or isolated event, and that makes it easy to predict and understand what causes it. Behavior is like throwing a can in the recycling, while action is going out, buying a recycling bin, bringing it home, and deciding that I'm going to be the kind of person who recycles. Two, action is connected to behavior, and behavior is a part of action, but behavior is something I might just kind of do as I walk by the while action is something that I have to make the conscious choice to say, I want to do this. That makes behavior easier for us to understand because we can watch it, take notes, and as scientists, predict what caused it. We know two things about behavior because of this that are very valuable. We know that empowering current behavior can and does inspire long-term action. We know that. We also know that behavior, specifically pro-environmental behavior, is the result of a combination of three factors that we can specifically try to influence through games. In essence, we know that if a person has these three things, they're likely to engage in behavior and take future action. So by breaking down this large goal of action into these three things and understanding them as behaviors, we can narrow our design goal and then actually increase the likelihood of achieving the action outcome we're looking for. We can empower people to take action by designing towards behavior, and we call this the action behavior cycle. And it all begins with these three behavior factors I mentioned called the predictors of behavior. We call them this for incredibly scientific reasons in that they predict behavior. These are the elements that if we know they're present, and an individual, that that individual will be very likely to engage in pro-environmental behavior. Conversely, if we know these elements are not present, we can predict that the person will not behave in a pro-environmental way. When we design games to inspire sustainable action, we can use these three predictors to guide our design. We can make them sort of micro goals or mini goals, knowing that they will lead to the behavior, their design goals. If we can, through our games, increase one of these elements in an individual, we can increase their likelihood to engage in behavior. And in the long-term actions, perhaps create sustainable action by continuing to offer supports towards these actions through games and other interventions. So what are these magical predictors? The first, you might be able to guess, knowledge. A person has to know what they're doing to do it, right? Certainly someone without knowledge can take some pro-environmental behavior, but limited knowledge can decrease effectiveness or even make the behavior counterproductive, such as someone recycling something or putting in the recycling bin something that isn't actually recyclable and therefore ruining a whole load of plastics. Accurate systematic knowledge is the prerequisite it is absolutely necessary to engaging in effective behaviors. Two things are critical for game designers when teaching knowledge. First, we must provide actionable knowledge, right? That is the knowledge that comes from an understanding of a system. And that can be the government system, the ecosystem, a social system, whatever system. And in that system, 
an understanding of actions that can influence the system, actions that the player can take. It is not just being aware of problems, and that's the big distinction, because being just aware of problems, knowing that there is a climate issue, is what leads to climate anxiety until we introduce knowledge that can be acted on. Second thing that is critical for game designers is that knowledge is taught through experimentation and play, which games are obviously have, and it is not taught through info dumps, right? The idea of opening someone's brain and simply pouring knowledge into it does not work, unfortunately. Now, this takes us to our second, which is attitude. A pro-environmental attitude is critical for building the desire to take on pro-environmental behaviors, critical. There are a million reasons to not engage in pro-environmental behaviors that are often more expensive and more time-consuming on the front end. The pro-environmental attitude helps us justify the inconvenience of engaging in pro-environmental behavior. Pro-environmental attitudes are strongly informed by a sense of connection to nature, which can be supported by having experiences in nature, even virtual ones, so in-game experiences in nature. They're also supported by empathy for nature, and this can mean an emotional empathy for a specific creature or a specific place. And it can also mean a logical empathy for an understanding of how difficult it might be for a person or a creature in a situation, such as one affected by forest fires, to deal with that situation. It's also worth noting that attitude is strongly tied to complex social and personal experiences that are not easily influenced by one intervention, such as a game. And as much as we want to see it as the easy thing to influence, any intervention into attitude is a drop in a bucket which isn't to say it's not valuable. It is valuable, but we can't expect it to be an overnight magic wand. And this leads us to our final predictor, which is perceived self-efficacy. Simply put, perceived self-efficacy is the belief that what I do matters, that I can make a difference. It is critical for long-term sustained behavior because without the belief that it matters, people often give up. People Say, why am I bothering? Perceived self-efficacy, or PSE, is built directly from perceived success in actions, meaning that if I take smaller actions and see them as impactful and see them as valuable and see them as meaningful, I am more likely to continue to build on those to take more and more difficult and more and more impactful actions. Together, PSE, attitude, and knowledge are all the three individual pieces that we need to engage in meaningful pro-environmental behavior. But they're also interconnected. Without knowledge, we can't engage in behaviors that increase PSE. Increasing our PSE often increases our pro-environmental attitude. And increasing our pro-environmental attitude leads to more behaviors and knowledge seeking. In essence, a little bump to one of these can actually have a cascading, much larger effect on the other two and creates a cycle, which is why it is critical to aim small for behavior change. If you aim big for just action, we're setting ourselves up for failure because people are hard to change. The likelihood of a single game inspiring someone to take long-term action all by itself is low. However, it can be a piece of the puzzle. The more precise of the piece you choose to place, the more likely you are to put it in the right place. Meaning, if you're specifically targeting knowledge, for example, you're far more likely to focus on designs successfully, or I'm sorry, that successfully achieve an increase in the target knowledge and therefore influence attitude and perceived self-efficacy over time, creating a long-term self-sustaining cycle of intent to act. While if you're targeting something just like action, you might spread yourself too thin or have something like a response to an I will do this thing right now and then forget about it later. Again, though, we're in luck because, you see, games are kind of already perfect for achieving any one of these three predictors of behavior. Which brings me to my favorite part of my presentation. Your game no matter what it is, has three things, right? Goals, barriers, and means. You give the player a mission to accomplish, their goal. 
You give them something that makes this mission a challenge, a barrier. And you give the player the tools to overcome that challenge, the means. Mario's goal, Mario, excuse me, Mario's goal is to walk to the right. Right, sorry, I'm on mirror, aren't I? His barriers range from Goombas to infinite chasms in the ground. Uh, his means range from jumping uh, to fireballs, right? He has a goal, he has barriers, and he has means. You guys are pros. I don't have to preach this to you. You're professional game designers, but I will ask that you consider how these three core elements of game design might connect to the personal goals, barriers, or means of pro environmental action and to the player as we talk to the next section about the tools of how you can impact our pro environmental predictors. In this section, I want to call attention to the three primary avenues, the three tools your team has in reaching your players. Uh, the three ways your games talk to the players, essentially. Those are the narrative, the mechanics and design, and the metagame. Uh, and in case it isn't obvious by now, I really like breaking things into threes. Uh, so while we talk through these three, I want to keep in mind that my goal here is to just point out a few ways that we know these elements can influence our predictors of behavior. Again, your professional designers, you know your games and you know your trade. I'm not here to tell you how to design, just to show you how the skill set you have already mastered is a skill set that can translate directly to inspiring, inspiring climate action. So let's start with the narrative. This is everything your creative team does, right? The story, the setting, the characters, the lore, the art. And as much as it might not seem critical to every game, as Arnaud pointed out, even a subtle change of why are we fighting can drastically shift the narrative from shoot everything that moves to a fight to protect the forest. Narratives connect our predictors in a number of ways. The creation of emotional experiences has been shown to translate to real world empathy. So long as there is a real world connection, Narratives also provide opportunities for role play and experimentation with new identities. Current research is showing us that people whose real world communities are not pro environmental or even like anti environmental can actually find a safe space in a video game to experiment and acting like an environmentalist, leading to confidence in taking on real world behaviors and engaging in difficult real world social situations with people who are not environmentalists. By far, though, and surprising to most, is the impact a narrative can have on a player's sense of perceived self-efficacy. The player is usually powerful in a game, and the player changes the world. When the game world and the characters reflect that a player's environmental choices were powerful and important to the story, we can see a marked increase in perceived self-efficacy. So our second tool is the mechanics and design of the game. That is, what is their experience? The core game loops, the core dictating controls, the mechanics, the underlying system. Uh, the common application of these is towards increasing knowledge, and for good reason, because humans learn by experimentation and inquiry. Games can teach us by reflecting real world systems how we can interact with those systems in a way that a book can't ever teach us. The challenge is in balance, not realistic enough, and it can't translate into real world usage too realistic, and it can be boring and cumbersome. The solution in most cases is focus, just like in focusing on a goal. We can't account for all of climate as a feasible system to sim simulate, but we might be able to tackle, say, forest as fires, or I'm sorry, <laughs> forest fire in a game. And this brings us to our last element, the metagame. The metagame is everything outside the game itself. The stuff created by the players, in-game chats, the memes, the subreddit, the discord. Metagame spaces are incredible tools for pro-environmental behavior. They create socially supportive spaces for pro-environmental attitudes, build up pro-environmental behaviors and social norms, and act as focal points for organizing real-world events. They distribute knowledge. Basically, they can do anything the players want them to. The issue is that when facing the challenge of pro-environmental design, teams tend to ignore the metagame space because it's too out of their control. The players are too unpredictable. The investment in organizing is too weighty. Some people even say you can't design to impact social interactions. But that simply isn't true. It isn't easy, but the rewards are immense. And I'd like to cite a quick example. 
Riot Games, at its peak popularity, faced an immense backlash for the incredibly toxic behavior of its player base in the in-game chat. Through good research and community engagement, Riot put together a series of UI and UX solutions, as well as a social tribunal to review players who violated the rules. The result was a complete 180 in terms of social behavior towards one another. Player toxicity decreased, positivity increased, and formerly toxic behaviors actively sought out ways to make amends for their behaviors. It can be done. The metagame space can be designed with effort. So we have our three predictors of behavior. These are the environmental design goals to achieve your unique impact potential. And we have our three primary game design elements, which are our tools to achieve those goals. But like any kind of design work, it takes practice to know which tool is the right tool for the job. It takes practice identifying the goal as well, honestly. We're about to get some of that practice. That's my a forewarned group activity. Evil laugh. Uh, but before we do, I want to remind you to aim small. The more precise the goal, the more achievable it is. In a moment, we're going to embark uh, on an activity. We'll go into breakout groups, and each group will get a quick link uh, to a PPT that you'll be able to interact with. Uh, you'll be doing a quick design activity. Because you're going to be randomly assigned, you'll get a new hypothetical game that your group will work on. Think of this as an opportunity to collaborate and put some of your ideas to use without the weight of all of the systems you're already thinking about in your own game, right? Because that's baggage. Uh, you'll, get a, you'll get a chance to come up with a core game idea. Oh, I'm sorry. You'll be given a core game idea, an audience, and a platform. And you'll be given the chance to identify a transformational goal and identify ways to put the tools at hand towards achieving that goal, leaving it the chance to get some examples of what that would look like in gameplay. And I want to point out that, yes, this is a lot, and we're only going to take 20 minutes to do it. So don't feel pressured to finish everything. Start with your transformational goal that you want to do, which behavioral predictor you're going to aim at, and then go where your team is excited. Teams that succeed in this kind of activity when we do these breakout groups are the ones that say yes quickly and just start working and have fun with it. We're not here to make a real game. We're here to have a little experience bouncing this activity around in our heads because the real goal is to take the same activity back to your team for your actual green game activation. So we'll take 20 minutes to do this, and then we'll have a few minutes for a share out if we have brave individuals who are willing to do that. And that I want to kind of lean into is that this is not enough time for this activity. And for a lot of the teams, this is not even enough time to really choose what goal we want to pursue. And the message here is that this pre-work, this work that goes before the development, before the design is critical, this decision-making process of what are we actually trying to do is absolutely crucial. Because if you don't do it, you wind up wasting effort. And there's no room for wasted effort in game development. And there's no room for wasted effort in volunteer work, right? We know these things to be true. We hold these truths to be self-evident that game designers do not have an abundance of free time. And so I implore you to take the lesson of this pre-work takes time before you engage in the process of developing. and to take, as you do with your, unique, with your unique impact potential, take this work back to your team and encourage them to work through this in whatever way makes sense on a long, larger scale. Now, before I leave you, uh, I want to end with a reminder that our, our ultimate goal is not behavior, but action. And as game designers, we have the ability to shape only one real experience in a lifetime of infinite experiences. But this doesn't make your game less powerful. When you are designing your team's game entry, remember to think beyond how your player will experience your game and into how they will contextualize that experience as part of their entire lifetime of experiences. 
Our predictors of pro-environmental behavior are the starting steps towards a self-initiated action. Knowledge, when combined with an understanding of the social context, becomes actionable knowledge. Attitude, supported by social group and armed with the prerequisite knowledge, becomes an intent to act. And increasingly impactful behaviors, fueled by increasingly perceived self-efficacy, eventually results in a self-impact on one's life and a real and observable change in the day-to-day. -day. And this cycle is self-perpetuating in a positive way. Keep in mind how, as you design your games, you move through these three layers. What tools are available to you? What immediate change can you inspire? And how can you support translating this immediate change into a sustainable change for the player and for the environment? Thank you so much for taking the time to join us today. Next Thursday, Trevin will talk through designing your specific impact, providing some much needed real world context, as I just mentioned, and examples of how to give substance to the abstract concepts we've covered today. Thank you so much for joining us, and we will see you again on April 11th.